Here is today's Sunday case study brought to you by the Scotty Dog. This week, let's talk about young patients with lower back pain. I have a 28-year-old male who comes to my office and complains of back pain for 10 years. He was a lineman for his high school football team and did a lot of heavy weights during his teenage years. He would notice that his back pain was worse when he first woke up in the morning, but then slowly started to get better throughout the day. He was able to control his pain somewhat with over-the-counter ibuprofen as well as activity modifications. However, as he got older into his late 20s, the pain just became unbearable. Anytime he stood up and bent over, the pain just was intractable and then he began to develop a sciatica pain down his left leg all the way to his toes. Here is the standing x-rays of his lower back. Here is his oblique x-ray of his lower back. And here is his MRI scan. Okay, so what's his diagnosis? What events in high school led to this injury and why did I even mention that? Was it relevant or not? What does his x-ray show and his MRI show and why did I show you that oblique x-ray? And last but not least, assuming that the patient has tried exhaustive conservative treatment like physical therapy and or injections, what treatment would you recommend? Stay tuned tomorrow for the full video explanation. So let's go through the answers of the case study I presented yesterday. Now remember we said this was a 28 year old man who had about 10 years of chronic lower back pain. He lifted weights a lot in high school and he was a lineman uh, in high school for his high school football team. And he began to develop back pain about that time. And over the years it kind of progressively got worse. Here is his x-rays and basically what we see here is that his L4 and L5 has a spondylolisthesis or basically his L4 and L5 are shifted on each other. I also showed you guys these oblique x-rays to see if you picked up on this and many of you did that we're looking at the Scotty dog picture here on an x-ray and let me tell you what that means. Basically what we see on an oblique x-ray is we can see the pedicle and then the outline of the vertebral body which forms a Scotty dog picture here. Now here's a regular Scotty dog and then here's a Scotty dog with a collar. So if we were to outline it like this, you can see that this dog has a collar or basically that as a fracture through the pars. Here's a model of the spine and we see the bone, the disc, and the next bone down. And then the anatomy of the vertebrae is uh, the bones are shaped like this and it has bones that circle around and encase the nerves. Now the pars is one of the side bones right here, which make this a complete circle. Here is a cartoon version looking at the spine from the side where it points out where the pars is. And a pars fracture is what you see on this x-ray. And then a spondylolisthesis is where the pars is separated and slipped forward. So the diagnosis is that this patient has bilateral L4 pars fractures, which is causing instability of his L4 and L5. Now he likely developed that in high school when he was a lineman and was doing heavy weight lifting. It can be a chronic stress fracture from lifting weights and from hyperextension, which is where you get uh, with being a lineman where you're chronically getting extended or pushed back uh, whenever you're trying to tackle somebody. That can lead to a chronic stress fracture of the pars and with time that fracture can separate or widen. So basically what that means is as time went on, he developed the separation of this fracture and his bone continued to shift forward like that. And essentially his spine became unstable where he was having a shift of his L4 and L5. That led him to develop a weak spot in his L4 and L5 disc. And this demonstrates a weak spot where you can actually herniate part of the disc, which will pinch on the nerve. I showed this MRI picture where you can see the shift of the L4 on the L5 with this disc herniation here. And that's on his left side, which is causing that left-sided sciatica. So the answer is that the patient has bilateral stress fractures or pars fractures, causing instability as time went on or shifting of his L4 and L5. And you saw that on the x-ray where the L4 and L5 are shifted on each other. That led to instability of his disc, which led to the disc herniation. And now the patient has chronic back pain that is now worse because of the impinged nerve due to the disc herniation that is caused by his chronic weightlifting back in high school and the hyperextension injuries from football. So that was relevant. And his symptoms progressed despite all the conservative treatment options over the years. He, he rested, he did activity modifications, he did physical therapy, he did injections, and the x-rays demonstrated progressive slippage of his vertebrae. 
So this patient did go on to need surgical intervention and surgical intervention for instability in the spine or slippage of, of the spine is unfortunately a spinal fusion where we basically restabilize that spine. This is his final x-rays that's demonstrating the fusion that we did on his spine. Now this video has already gotten very long with me explaining the process leading up to the surgery. So I'm gonna explain the full surgery and my recommendations for surgery on this in another video to follow tomorrow. So in our last two videos, we discussed a young patient with chronic lower back pain who ended up being diagnosed with bilateral pars fractures, failed conservative treatment, and now presents for surgery. So how do we go from this to this? So we know this patient failed conservative treatment and now presents for surgical management. What are the goals of surgery and what are we trying to accomplish with surgery? So remember what we discussed a spondylolisthesis is due to pars fractures is you have these cracks in the pars of the vertebral body and this causes the bones to slip forward on each other causing the slippage and then the pain. So the goal of surgery is really to uh, remove this disc and get this realigned back into this position and locked into place. So in this patient's post-operative x-rays, you can see that we were able to realign his spine and pull L4 back onto L5. So how do we do that? Now I have a joke that I say if you ask five different spine surgeons how they would approach a case, you would get 10 different answers. And honestly, you can approach this case in many different fashions. There is many ways to approach the L4 and 5. You can approach it anteriorly or through the belly button. You can approach it laterally for an O-lift or a D-lift. And you can approach it posteriorly for a PLIF or a T-lift. Now, my favorite approach for an L4 and 5 spondylolisthesis is an anterior lumbar fusion. I also favor this approach at L5 and S1. So let me tell you what that means. So we typically make an incision on the front part of the patient's belly. Track the contents of the abdominal cavity to the side. This leads us to this, which is uh, you see the spine with the aorta and the iliac vein in front of it. Now we typically use a vascular surgeon to help mobilize these vessels and move them to the side, which gives us access to the L4 and L5 space. Here is an animation that shows removal of the disc. After the disc is removed, you will then take an implant, which can be made of titanium or peak, and then pack the center part of the implant with bone graft. Then the implant is subsequently loaded up onto an inserter and then placed into the disc space. And upon placing this, uh, you typically get correction of the slippage. Now, most of these implants typically come with screws, which help stabilize that cage in position. And then the locking mechanism is engaged. Now, once that's done, you'll have realignment of the spine like this with the implant in place with the bone graft, which will allow L4 and L5 to fuse together with time. Now, in cases of immobile slippage where it's highly shifts around, uh, many surgeons will supplement with posterior fixation on the backside. So in this patient's case, that's exactly what I did. Now, once we finish with the anterior part of the case, uh, we will then turn the patient over on the stomach in order to add the screw fixation on the back. And these are what pedicle screws look like. They're threaded screws, just like any normal screws, and that goes into the bone. And then this part allows the rod to be captured. So once the all four screws are placed, two into L4 and two into L5, you'll have rods that slip into within the tulip head, and then you add caps to kind of pin it into place like that and that will add complete stabilization of the patient's spine. So then the patient is all done and you can see how we went from this to this. Now a surgery like this in my hands typically takes one hour for the anterior side and one hour for the posterior side. I do keep the patient overnight, sometimes one to two nights in the hospital, and the patient is allowed to get up, walk around, and do whatever is needed to be done, and then when they are discharged home, they are able to walk around. Now there is some post-surgical pain that typically resolves within four to six weeks. We typically have patients on restrictions after the surgery in order to achieve uh, optimal healing. And within 12 weeks, I usually allow patients to go back to lifting more heavy things. So by realigning his spine, we take the pressure off of the sciatic nerve. So his radicular pain or shooting pain down his leg is gone. And then his back pain is also gone because that slippage is no longer there. So I hope during this series of videos that you guys learned something about pars fractures, spondylolisthesis, and how we treat certain spine problems.